Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, a lot of you need the timing and to need the understanding of how things and when things happened. This is Pentecost, and you may or may not believe this, but it has literally been 50 days since Easter. Well, how many days between Easter and Pentecost? It's 50. Well, what about Ascension? We just had Ascension as a celebration. Well, we know from after the resurrection, Jesus was here on earth 40 days. So if you add and minus 50 and 40, you get 10. So 10 days between the Ascension when Christ went to heaven to the time that the disciples received the power from on high. Now, 10 days doesn't seem like a lot unless you're waiting. I'm pretty bad after two days of trying to wait and get things done. Now, I'd like to share with you today these words about how Jesus compels us to do mission but doesn't force us to do mission. This church is strong in ministry. And the ministry that we do, caring for one another, reaching out to one another, is one aspect of it. But there's another aspect of church, and that's missions. And missions means reaching out to the community. Well, I believe the Holy Spirit does it in such a way that we are compelled, not forced. Forced means being doing something to someone against their will. And God isn't going to do that. He's going to allow us to have free will and make those decisions on who we are and what we do. But the Holy Spirit does compel. It's like that strong urge or desire to do something. And you have to recognize the time that the disciples are gathered together at Pentecost is like their thanksgiving. It's a harvest celebration of first fruits. And you may or may not know this, but if you have a harvest, there's an urge to collect it, to bring it in, to bring about what you're looking for. I believe the Holy Spirit compels us to do five different things. We'll get to six, and then seven, I think, relies a lot on you. So let's look at six things that the Spirit does compelling his people. First of all, we begin with waiting. How many of you enjoy waiting? None of us. Well, you might. You may be that one in a million that enjoys waiting. You're the person that just enjoys waiting and having it be a time of preparation. I'll tell you the difference. When I would travel, I took the mindset of Asians. When they would announce, I'm sorry, but your flight is delayed, in Asia, they all get excited. It's delayed. Hooray! What are you getting all excited about? We get more time to eat. We get more time to enjoy and sing and gather together. And I would watch all the businessmen from the States run up to the counter and yell at the flight people, saying, we have to leave on time. The longer the delay, the more waiting, the better it was for the people that I was with. And I've kind of adapted that mindset. If I have to wait, I'm going to enjoy the time waiting to what happens. But eventually, you have to go. That's what Christ is telling them. He's compelling them to go to Jerusalem, celebrate in the three festivals required of the day. But he's telling them to go because you had to wait. You had to wait for the power that came on high now I'm compelling you to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. Well, they weren't quite sure what they were celebrating at the time. They knew it was a harvest. And what a perfect illustration of missions. It means there's a field out there, the produce, the things are ready to be harvested. We're compelled in order for it not to be lost. And timing is an important thing. You can't always say, I'll go when things get perfect. And that's what the disciples are learning. So they go to Jerusalem and they wait. And then something happens. 
while they're there, a power comes upon them like tongues of fire. And oftentimes it's hard to describe the Holy Spirit other than the person of God that works within our hearts, that gathers us together, that calls us, that sanctifies us, that enlightens us with all of these gifts. And by getting us to come and then go, that is such a powerful message in missions. Do you realize how long they had to wait? I keep going back to that because it's really hard to understand the length of time the people were waiting for this moment, this birthday of the church. Did you hear in the lessons from the Old Testament? They saw the fire leading them at night, and they saw the filling of the tabernacle with the presence of God. And they were waiting for that moment that not only would it fill the tabernacle or the temple, it would go out and be taken to the community. That it would be given in such a powerful way that the message of God would be proclaimed. But sometimes when you go, you have to stay. And oftentimes the Holy Spirit convinces you to stay because you don't always get results right away. When I church planted as a missionary, I went out and I was waiting four years of seminary. I was ready to go. I went. And then all of a sudden I realized nothing's happening. But Lord, look at all the good that I'm doing and all the words that I'm saying and all the people that I've gathered together they wouldn't worship. They wouldn't start and plant a congregation. I said, what's wrong with you people? Oh, we'd like you to come and visit, but we're not ready for a church. Okay, what are we going to do? Well, just wait and stay with us. The longer you stay, the more you'll learn about who we are and the type of church and type of congregation that we want to plant through the Spirit. Do you know why it took five years? for the church, first church to get planted, the individual who was leading worship had to learn how to write, read and write. It took me five years. I didn't realize everybody in the church was illiterate. They couldn't read the word of God. They were just memorizing it in the first five years. The moment that the first person, and I'll never forget this moment, we had a baptism the first time we always had to have four witnesses. I don't know why. They didn't like two witnesses. They didn't trust each other as much as we trust one another. But they had four witnesses, and I said, what's going on with this baptism? And we do the baptism, and they're all grinning and smiling at me like there's an inside joke. I'm not a big fan of inside jokes. And then all of a sudden, I realized what was going on. Usually, nobody could learn or learned how to read and write, so I had to bring a stamp pad, and the witnesses would put their thumbprint on it and put it on the document. This time, all four individuals came up, and it looked like first-grade writing, but it was heartwarming and spirit-driven. They all wrote their names for the first time. And that baptismal certificate is one that I just relished and thanked God for, we had gotten to the point where they could write their names. And they could easily understand how God had caused me to stay and be patient, not through efforts of my own. I was not forced to do it, but compelled by God. And what does God compel us to do? What were these 120 and there were 120 there, but the 12 began to be able to speak. Proclaiming the word of God is one of the most powerful things, but they were compelled to speak in languages that were not their own. Some said, what does this mean? What does it mean when somebody who learns a language is able to use that language in the service of God, but use it immediately without any background or training or understanding? The Cretans hear it in their language. The Arabians hear it in theirs. The people from Pomphylia and Pontus 
the Medes, everybody gets to hear God's word in the language of their heart. And what's going to be the reaction? Some people, what does this mean? The other, they're drunk. I tell you this, this is so true. I have seen people come overseas and they say, my fluency gets better when I drink. It doesn't. I have heard people try to speak a foreign language. You know what they do? They speak louder and slower, and it doesn't make them understand any better by yelling or speaking louder. This is the gift that God has given to them. It was only 9 o'clock in the morning. They were not inebriated. They were being powered by the Spirit to speak these words. One of the phrases that I use often, because we're getting ready to pack for the troops, we're a different kind of army. The army of the Lord is different. We march on our knees. I have seen powerful things happen in regards to missions, in reaching out to the community of caring for people, not so much of what we do on our feet, but what we do on our knees. The Spirit compels us to get down on our knees and to pray to God and to thank him. A crisis, an emergency happens at church. There are people that are actively involved in assisting, and that's good. That's the way it should be in the church. That moment of service, because we no longer are slaves, we are now harvesters. We are reaching out in being compelled to serve not because we have to, but because we want to. And not only doing that, we pray. We pray for individuals each and every day, and you may not hear it. I'm able to multitask in certain things. I am able to lead worship, but also to pray deeply, not only on behalf of the congregation, but for each individual. And praying to God is compelling by the Spirit to know when to pray, how to pray, and what to pray for. I am so inspired by what happened at that day because something happened in such a powerful way that we went from 120 people to over 3,000. How does that happen? How do you get such a movement? It's because it was prayed for. It was promised by God. And God compels us to listen to his promises given of old and to take those promises for us today. The fifth thing that God encourages us to do, which if you include waiting would be the sixth, is to give. And I'm not talking money. Money doesn't always give the answers to what we find and need. I need to give your hearts. Giving your hearts to missions saying, says, I'm going to have an empathy and a care for other people. I'm going to be actively involved in praying and supporting and being involved and volunteering and caring because we are the people of God and his children. And he compels us to give of ourselves. Because we are the hands, the feet, the mouth, the eyes, the ears of Jesus. And when you help somebody and care for someone, it shows in who we are and what we do. The last thing is, number seven, and it fits very well. We're compelled to give and wait and go and stay and proclaim and pray. We're also compelled to rest. That's one thing you can't force somebody. There comes a moment within our lives when we need to rest, and Sabbath rest is the best. Sabbath rest means being in the presence of God, being renewed by the Spirit, being compelled by Him so that I am ready to go to work. When I was a vicar in Minnesota, and I'll conclude with this, I waited for one of the farmers to ask me, do you want to come out and see what harvest is like? I waited, and finally I got the phone call. And I got the phone call, and I showed up, and they put me in a giant million-dollar combine, 
in this jump seat, air conditioned with a radio. It was wonderful. I said, what are farmers complaining about? This is the easiest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I'm sitting there and I'm staying and the fellow said, well, we're not done yet. And I said, okay, I'll stay around. I mean, we worked for two hours. Isn't that enough? And he said, no, we're not done yet. Pray for me. And I prayed with him. And then I told his family how much I enjoyed doing it. And they said, oh, wait, we're not finished yet. I said, oh, good, now comes rest time. Oh, no, let's eat. So we had this big meal, which they call dinner, and I call lunch. So we ate dinner, and then we went out again. And this time he said, you know, the combine doesn't get it all. I said, oh, well, you'll need a worker for that. And they said, well, guess what? You're the worker. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm the combine guy. Do you know how to drive it? No. Do you know the computer? No. Do you know how to handle it? No. Well, you are perfectly suited. God has called you to go and glean from the field. And I said, what's glean mean? He said, find the leftovers. Find the parts that have not been harvested. Do you know the back-breaking work it is to pick corn out of a field of when it's already been knocked over? And you'd be surprised. I said, what, who am I doing this for? He said, oh, the pigs. I'm working for a bunch of pigs? I've been called as a shepherd to work among the sheep. I have not been called as a farmer to work among the pigs. And he said, humility is the most important aspect of mission work and ministry. You don't get to determine who are the sheep, the goats, and the pigs. You do the work, and God will give the blessing. We close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, these things we do ask in faith. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would compel us to wait, to go, to stay proclaimed, to pray, and to give, and even to rest in the Sabbath. For by doing so, we receive by faith the power of the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, may this power be used in our midst today and always. For we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please rise now as we take this opportunity to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus 